Hello, everyone. Uh, welcome to my talk today. Uh, my name is Mary Grigleski. Um, I'm here to talk about uh, Apache Pulsar and Apache Pino, uh, about all about optimizing speed and scale of real-time analytics using these two open source projects. I'm really happy to be here today. Uh, and if you are interested in getting a copy of this uh, slide deck, um, of course, it is also available if you are virtual. Uh, you have virtual access, and I have already uploaded the uh, the the, the um, slides up to the sked, uh, dot, schedule dot com or the, that site, and so you should be able to get that. If not, then it is also available here. Um, basically, it's a Bitly link, um, and basically it is just stored on my Google link on my Google Share Drive, but you can access it here. So. Now, even if you miss it, don't worry about it because it will be, this slide deck is will be made available to you or is already available for you to look at. My name is Mary Kogleski. I'm a streaming developer advocate at Datastax. Uh, Datastax is based in California, is a leading data management company. We specialize in essentially database as a service um, and primarily too, we are very open source focused. We're all about Apache uh, projects. Uh, first and foremost, uh, Cassandra, if you are user of Cassandra, then you probably have heard of our company too, because we have the VP of the Apache Cassandra project is at our company too. And also too, you know, besides you can use it open source, of course, or you can use it, you know, launch it yourself into the cloud. Better yet, you know, is to use our database as a service. So there's no SQL, big data, you know, columnar database, very fast and very, you know, high resiliency, um, never goes down. So, and now too, the company also adding in streaming. So that's where I'm going to bring a bit of an introduction about the streaming uh, side that we have with DataSax today, and that's Apache Pulse. And uh, so essentially, we're very much cloud native uh, platform. Everything is kind of meant to be operating on the cloud, even though you can still use our non-cloud version, but we're, we're encouraging folks, you know, you'll realize that it's actually save you a lot of time if you use our cloud platform. Previously, I was a developer advocate uh, doing Java stuff at IBM. So I also was involved a lot too, mostly, uh, in fact, uh, with open source projects, um, WebSphere, uh, there's also WebSphere, the open source Open Liberty too. So that's where I was. Plus, I also did a bunch of reactive systems too. If you uh, pay attention to it, event streaming, that has always been something dear to my heart. Um, I'm based in Chicago. I'm a Java champion. Um, I'm also the president and executive board member of the Chicago Java Users Group. So that's a volunteer run group. Um, that's I'm a really big believer in community, tech community. We all learn together and share things. I also help to co-organize a couple of uh, IBM run uh, sponsored uh, meetups too in Chicago. Um, then I, my background though, I have extensive experience in doing product and application design development, um, integration work, deployment experience, uh, you name it, I've done it. I specialize more in event-driven uh, reactive systems and open source and cloud-based, uh, cloud-enabled distributed systems. So that's my area. And these are how you can get a hold of me, but I'll share with you know my information with you towards the end of this presentation. Now, I just want to bring kind of like quick to your attention too. This talk, right? I was supposed to be doing it with StarTree and uh, with because of the real-time analytics part and uh, supposed to be Corinne Wallock. However, uh, she's no longer the community manager at StarTree and actually Mark uh, Needham, uh, who's based in England, uh, the United Kingdom, he was very happy to uh, do the talk. However, I think because of the short notice and there's just not time to do it. And so I just want to bring uh, you all to, his attend uh, or bring you know him to your attention because if you have more questions about Star Tree about Apache Pino he will be the person that you can reach out to so these are his uh, links right he's a developer advocate but he's also strongly very technical too his experience has been a lot into like big data uh, analytics that type and he's a great guy to work with so don't be afraid to reach out to him uh, to Mark so. Okay, now let me kind of give you a quick kind of rundown on what we're going to talk about. First of all, what is real time analytics? We'll spend some time kind of giving you uh, the the you know the the basics of what is real time analytics, and then we can then go into understanding the problems that we are trying to solve, which is the types of analytics use cases, um, examples of user facing real time analytics, and evolution how it evolves over time. Real time analytics. Now the thing is, then the next thing then is 
it's basically saying that we know the kind of problem that we are trying to solve, right? What is the solution? So just want to kind of present to you two open source solutions. Uh, one, Apache Pino, which is the one that kind of handles all the real-time uh, analytics part, right? And, and then the other thing is real-time ingestion, right? You, you're analyzing all the data comes in, but how does it comes in? So that's when Apache Pulsar comes into play, right? It is an event streaming platform. So I'm just going to introduce to you these two uh, platforms, essentially. And uh, bear in mind that this is going to be uh, very much introductory level. Uh, if you want to kind of get more information, I provide you with a lot of links too that you can get to. And plus companies, uh, data stacks, and also StarTree, we have folks there to help you at any time. Okay, so what is real-time analytics, right? Real-time analytics is basically the discipline that applies logic and mathematics to data, right? And then basically data that comes in, right? It, it doesn't mean anything if you don't do anything kind of useful to it. And it's basically there's logic, there's mathematics. In fact, we live in a world that we rely a lot in mathematics, right? All the scientific stuff. And it basically then for real-time analytics is that it provide insights, right? For making uh, better decisions quickly. And this comes, this definition comes from Gartner, right? And the folks, I'm sure you're familiar with Gartner, uh, this analyst, uh, famous analyst uh, company. And so if you kind of take a look at it, right, we are kind of all talking about events, you know, these days, we hear about event driven, event storming, event um, driven, um, event driven microservices, serverless, all of these things. One way or the other, too, it is actually around the concept of events, right? In my own talk uh, that I introduced a much deeper level of um, Apache Pulsar, I talk first to about what is what are events, right? What exactly it is that we're trying to capture. It is a bit kind of harder to look at, right? Especially when we, right? When we first uh, started programming, I bet all of us, you know, you too, myself included, right? We learn how to do things a bit on the old fashioned way, right? The traditional way when we do coding. We never did any event driven stuff because it's, it's hard to do, it's not easy. We're dealing with concurrency. We're dealing with asynchronous style of processing. So that's what like events are, right? To the to computing. And so if you kind of take a look at it, right? If I give the definition, I go to um, like a dictionary.com, right? So it's talk about events are essentially um, a point in time and space, right? Talk about time and space. Okay, first of all, event happening, and it assumes itself a position in space, X, Y, Z coordinate, right? If you want to bring the math in. And then there's also time too. So basically too, the, the data changes over time. If you plot, you know, time as a fourth dimension, you can see over time, right? It, the, the data, the value changes. But interestingly too, how we kind of process data in for events is that we basically treating events once it happens is basically immutable. You cannot change it, right? So it, it kind of brings in a lot of very interesting way how can we capture events? How can we make sense of, you know, all of the data that are captured by events? And then we also then have other ways of saving all of these events for later analysis kind of uh, purposes, for example. Now, the thing is though, in today's talk, we are talking about real-time events. So that's why too, we want to get into events because it's only through events. And I don't think there are any other better way. If you don't use event, how can you capture all the changes of data in real time, right? So, okay, so there we go events is one thing. And from events, we want to draw some insight, right? We look into the events, we take the data in chunks, you know, in a huge volume, we want to draw some uh, conclusion to it, some insight, right? To make sense. And, and as you can see, right, the insight we draw, we can basically, based on the results of this insight, we kind of lead to a set of steps for taking action on all of these different conclusions that we have drawn, for example, right? And then say, for example, you have your data warehouse, right? You are uh, realize that, you know, a lot of people are ordering, you know, something, let's say right now, almost uh, holiday time in, you know, in the US, we celebrate Christmas. So basically to um, their companies are stocking up, right? A lot of the, um, you know, vendors are stocking up all of the Christmas presents and there are certain things that are very popular. So basically too, you kind of keep track of the, you know, of, of your uh, inventory and then and you realize, oh, wow, that this year, what is uh, popular, right? Let's say um, some kind of, uh, you know, game 
thing very popular. Everybody's trying to get it. Then basically, too, you can take a look and over time you can say, oh, wow, every day there's so many people ordering and we make, you know, maybe uh, 2000 units and they are sold out within two days. Then we know we need to increase the inventory, for example. Right. So that kind of like based on events, some insight drawn and doing action on it. Now, as you can see, right, the value of data over time, as you can see, value on the y axis time on the um, uh, actually time on the x axis value on the y so as such too when an event happens um and basically when it happens right away you can see the value is being high so the, over time though then then the value of the data becomes stale so as you can see then what we're trying to capture is real time is basically the you know that when it happens you want to capture that value immediately kind of sends it to some processing and draw insights and then have action on it that type of stuff so now who is interested in this data that can be analysts management or users right now that's the thing too in today's talk we want to kind of highlight the fact that in this day and age right the modern day and age we're talking about <coughs> giving users access to the data analytics part and then that's what is kind of becoming kind of more important than just analysts looking at some business intelligence dashboard or management reading some reports right even all those things they are less of a real-time kind of uh, flavor to it but users and user analytics for example I'll be showing you some example of where we are seeing users analytics becoming more and more important okay so if we kind of take a look at this quadrant I really like from Mark right he has this quadrant basically right you you take a look at real-time analytics divide into four pieces, right? The machine facing. That's more about observability, right? Uh, and, and kind of that aspect, right? Machine facing is like, it could be like your, your you know, cloud is like running, you know, all of these things and, and you're observing it and see the, what is the load look like over time, for example, right? Observability, uh, how many transactions are being performed, all those things. Now, internally too, then you have also human facing, right? So you, you take maybe certain kind of applications that are, Makes sense to the business. And basically, these are human, you know, beings that take all of these, you know, kind of like, let's say my I operate a store, and the store is making sales, all of these things, and I want to have a real time dashboard that shows, you know, what is the, the sales figure looks like right over time, that's human facing, right. And then now, if you kind of look a little further too, is that you bring in a, a lot more like complexity to this picture is basically, right? Kind of more complex it is actually is more valuable for the business. For example, recommendation engine, as we all know, right? If we're shopping for things and we want to be able to kind of, um, let's say I'm shopping for a car and I want a car to be a certain way. Say for example, even for me two months ago, or actually not two months, a year ago, I was searching, uh, looking for a car. I actually want a manual uh, transmission and I always like Honda right so Honda does actually unfortunately doesn't make CRV or HRV with um, manual transmission so then I have to kind of look for some other way so immediately too if I input those information to a car search kind of configuration thing it can immediately comes back to me and say hey you know what get a Subaru for example right or or how do you pronounce Subaru right um, so I actually that's what I got I finally found a car that Subaru is a, a SUV right and sports utility vehicle that has actually manual transmission, right? So it's, it's kind of really cool, I think, yeah. So that's one thing. And another usage, right? How What do you use this for? Fraud detection, right? We all have bank accounts. We all kind of know that there are always thieves kind of out there, right? In real banks, you get thieves trying to break into the bank and steal money. But on the internet, right? On cyberspace in computers, you also have hackers trying to kind of commit crime and steal somebody's money. So this kind of, um, kind of, uh, you know, essentially the systems that we can deploy to is some sort of fraud detection system that are monitoring maybe your account, right? Let's say you are all based in Tokyo and then all of a sudden your bank account got some debit. Uh, it's basically the money was kind of draw withdrawn in Hokkaido or something, right? So in that case, there's a problem there and you have your fraud detection system that are event-driven in nature. So immediately it knows that, oh, something is wrong. I get noticed 
identify, I grab all the data. It's basically, you know, uh, this uh, the the customer account. The customer is living in Tokyo, but they're a strange debit being taken in Hokkaido. So please check, and they they will notify you, and then you take action on it. And you might say, oh, I'm on vacation, so not a big issue, right? Like that. So okay, so those are examples of some real time analytics, right? And also too thing in here too that provides you with even more kind of higher level kind of a business value would be like say an order tracking system right and an order that these kind of things are more external because you're tracking for example you have package delivery here in the u.s we have amazon delivery we order things and it delivers on amazon truck and so basically the order gets tracked over time and gives you real-time uh data and it's like basically it was could be saying that oh uh you know i'm i live in chicago so the the uh I order some things and basically it's being shipped from New York, right? Something New York City. So New York City comes and then to Chicago and I, I'd be like, okay, let me see. It is in downtown, you know, but I live in more uptown. So I kind of follow it. And those things are what we need, right? In order to be able to analyze all the data and provides very useful information real time to the end user. Okay. So with that, let me kind of go into the next thing is exciting, right? So types of analytics use cases. So there are dashboards and BI, like business intelligence kind of tools that we are more, maybe as we were younger back in the days, right? We were kind of helping out to generate reports, you know, based on some data that occurs during the day. We collect all of the data from spreadsheet from different department, whatever it is. And then basically we take the data and draw up some graphs and show some kind of movement of your money, price of your, maybe you are working for a trading firm, some instruments, how do they change it over time? Things like that, right? As you can see over here dashboard give you these they are not real time and then the thing is too we live in a world everything is all artificial intelligence and you know machine learning so machine learning too in fact they are prime kind of candidate to be using like real-time analytics and also kind of using some way of ingesting all of these data into type of really good candidate for this kind of use cases right okay and then another thing is basically user facing analytics so as you can see right those two are kind of older time and so now in a newer times, as we can see, we all have LinkedIn profile. On your LinkedIn profile, for example, and by the way, this is a picture of Karin and she was supposed to be, you know, presenting with me, but she kind of left me with these uh, slides so I can use them. So, but let me kind of kind of step through all of these first. So dashboards, right, BI tools, as you can see, these are kind of more like fixed kind of graphs you can look at. Uh, machine learning, for example, right? These are like, they immediately kind of process, you know, huge amounts of data to that kind of travel through time and, and gives you a, an analysis of, you know, upper bound, lower bound, for example, and now Millie's score, all of these things, you can kind of, you know, look at the data and draw immediate conclusion and alert people, uh, the aggregation, for example, in this case. And here too, I, I wanted to get to this one, like user-facing analytics, right? We all have LinkedIn profile. Um, we, as you you can see right it says who view your profile how many people look at it and and over like a spread of from july 7 to september 27 so gives you this kind of um kind of a basic analyt and analytics which is very useful too sometimes we like to know so basically this I wanted to let you know is that is powered by Apache Pino. So LinkedIn is a customer of Apache Pino. So they are using that to do the produce, right? As can you imagine, they have like many users and they can give us kind of really fast kind of time of analyzing all of the data who has viewed your profile. So it is pretty um, significant too. So actionable insight. So these are insight, right? That's what we want to draw. And why should I care, right? So as you can see, over here, operators, if we go back, right, operators are doing business monitoring, and basically then the analysts then will kind of look into business insights, and then basically, too, the insights can become, you know, in the hands of me, the users, customers, and they can use this for making money, too, monetization, too. So as you can see, right, um, this being able to have access <coughs> to so much data basically help transform the business world that we live in. And these are examples of user-facing real-time analytics, as you can see, right? Um, as you, you know, over here too, total number of users, 700 million. 
Query per second is 10,000 plus and uh, latency, right? The SLA is less than 100 milliseconds. So as you can see, it's real, real fast. The freshness of the data is in seconds, right? So that's what it is. So as you can see over here, we all know, you know, real-time analytics in on our dashboard in LinkedIn. So here too, there's also, you know, recruiters that are using it to analyze uh, candidates, right? Are they qualified? Am I looking for certain uh, people with certain number of years of experience in certain areas? So, and where they are located, all of these things. So as you can see, you know, the, the opportunities are limitless in here. And over here too, even an example of Uber Eats too, it might be something that uh, not sure if it is in your area, but in the US too, we have Uber. And then there's Uber Eats, which is like a food delivery service. But as you can see, having this real time component to it, it really helps because what happened is that over here, right? Um, uh, you can have, let's say, give you an example, right? Uh, I own pizza place. I'm the restaurant owner. And I, I have customers order food for me. And over here, as you can see, there is missed order um, or, uh, orders, right? And their downtime, all of these things. And having it real time is actually very useful. Let's say, right, you are delivering uh, pizza to a customer and they want actually mushroom pizza and you accidentally deliver meat pizza and they're not happy. They may actually go to the to the app, right, the Uber app and say, you know, this, uh, you know, pizza place is bad place because they gave me the wrong thing. But you, you know, immediately you can get this information right away. You look at it, you say that, oh, you know, I'm the owner. Of course, I don't want to lose my customer. I might react to it right away and say, hey, let me make you the, the you know, the mushroom pizza and immediately I'll deliver to you. I'll replace it with no cost. You, you keep the other one like that, right? So those are kind of opportunities that you can look into. Having something like real time is certain very, very useful. And examples of real-time analytics like Stripe is a payment system, right? There are different kinds of, um, you know, kind of thing too, you deal with financial, especially financial statements, right? Reporting, detecting bugs and problems and detecting financial risk, managing Stripe's liquidity, auditing past actions, all of these things that, you know, financial companies are needing it uh, kind of, uh, kind of very useful too. So Stripe also uses a lot of it too. That's a, you know, uh, not sure if you guys have Stripe here in, in Japan, but the thing is Stripe also is a payment system. I believe it is uh, global too. But anyway, so over here too, the kind of problem that we are trying to solve is basically teams are executing money movement, right? And you have financial data consumers in different departments. So, um, so let's see what kind of problem we're trying to face, right? So these are kind of unique challenges and opportunities. You want you know, high precision accuracy requirements, you know, aggregations must be exact. And there are many small unit transactions, plus small currency units that can vary too. And there's also like transactional level kind of integrity on granularity. Reports must be reproducible. And basically, um, you, you know, as you know, right, sometimes too, if systems are not good, then the problems and you are being serviced on an airline, just think of that, right? You're ready to fly and let's say from Japan to the US and often like, oh, a system doesn't work and the, the uh, you know, the staff would have to manually do things and those kind of things are kind of pain, right? So as you can see in a, any situation, you can have that and you have to kind of address them. So, okay, so again, back to financial places, there are strict compliance and security requirements too and all these things. So as you can see, right? So over here, as you can see over here, Internal analytics, you can actually have uh, latency higher because internal may be less about making money. It's more about an analyzing things. Freshness can be seconds to minutes. Concurrency, hundreds of users. But for external analytics, as you can see, we need really super fast, like milliseconds kind of latency, right? It doesn't have much delay. Freshness has to be in seconds and concurrency has can be millions of users too, yeah, like that. So, okay, so as you can see, evolution of real-time analytics. So real-time analytics landscape is rapidly changing, right? There's a start with o OLAP, right? Their OLAP system were more like batch type of systems, right? They're data collected. You want to do online analytics processing, right? These are like evolving with these trends. And what we used to have are internal facing analytics and data was much more structured. And the approximate data and query consistency and also, too, there's uh, queries, too. You can slice and dice them. And that's what kind of like their data warehousing kind of technique to use it, right? So at that time, too, it's more about gigabytes to terabytes of data. But look at today, right? 
we want user-facing analytics. These data are semi-structured. Um, also, we want to have strong data and query consistency. And these are full SQL semantics to it too. And plus to the amount of data from terabyte, we're gonna go into petabytes of data. So now, how do we then deal with a building a user-facing real-time analytics system, right? So as you can see, right, there are real-time ingestion and uh, you know, uh, high dimensionality and velocity of in ingestion has to be has to we have to meet this uh, kind of the requirement. Essentially, this system has to be highly available, very scalable, and also cost effective too. And also too, over on the other side is basically then kind of can generate the seconds freshness, uh, thousands of you know uh, query per seconds and milliseconds of latency. So very very fast and not much latency. So we want to introduce to you Apache Pulsar. And what else, right? So let's take a look at Pulsar first. So as such, right, Pulsar is, Apache Pulsar is an open source project, as I mentioned to you already, event streaming. And it, the thing is, it uses a pops up uh, architecture, much like Kafka. But kind of bear in mind too, there I've been asked too about what the, the difference is. Well, certainly there are differences. Because um, Apache Kafka was designed back in like 2005 or six or that time frame. So at the time, the cloud wasn't so much in the forefront yet. It was still starting. So, but then for uh, Yahoo, they already are, you know, into the cloud and everything. And then they realized that uh, whatever Kafka was doing would not be able to address some of the concerns that any kind of cloud environment would need, especially for event streaming. I mean, as such do you know, event streaming is kind of when we deal with event programming, it's a lot of moving parts. It's not as much like, you know, when we code a static thing, right? It's more like dynamic kind of in nature. So it uses a pops up kind of a uh, producer consumer type of um, you know architecture uh, pattern and essentially too then it relies on the runtime the broker which is a java runtime broker and you can have more than one broker too and this will help to increase throughput of your messages to get through so there are also those things being supported in pulsar and also too as you can see zk stands for zookeeper uh, zookeeper as some of you may be aware that's also an apache project and that's um you know as you can see everything is very open Open source in here. Zookeeper is basically, you know, kind of like managing a zoo. You know, many things are happening. The data is changing. So I'm there to kind of oversee um, all of these um, kind of uh, clusters and the configuration. All of these is sort of like look at it, kind of like an overall manage manager, kind of managing everything. Now the thing is though, you still can think a look that the broker is the one that is kind of being the core of everything. It coordinates and talk with the bookie, talks with the zookeeper and talks with the producer and consumer. So broker is essentially the, the, the center piece of everything, center mind of everything. As you can see, broker interacts with all of the bookkeeper, the bookies. I wanted to point out too, so um, Apache Pulsar, right? It, it doesn't want to deal with, um, and so to speak, right? It doesn't want to deal with all of managing all of the log messages. It's a lot of work if you kind of think of, you have to manage the, the, the messages that comes in and deliver them. And there are many rules sometimes you deliver these messages, right? It can be, if you're familiar with messaging systems and there, there can be huge chunk of data coming in, you need to chunk them. All these things and there are what about messages not being picked up you know you have or not being acknowledged by the consumer you have to keep them in the system there are also rules about time to live right um kind of all these things and dead letter queue right if the, if the letter for example um the topics is dead or something right you need to have special topics to handle those things and many things so Basically, Pausa says, I am going to deal with all the messaging part, working with the producers and the consumer delivering the messages. Let me find, let me ask a bookkeeper, which is Apache bookkeeper, and their specialty is to manage huge amounts of data, read and write to disk and also manage them. And if you have data that's already, you know, in the system, you need to do searches and look up. They are highly efficient as well. So as you can see, that's the architecture of Apache Pulsar. Okay, so real, real quick, right? Let's kind of take a look, uh, step into, you know, uh, what is event streaming and a step beyond just event messaging. Basically too, Pulsar is, is not just a messaging thing, right? Messaging, we're dealing with, okay, messages travel from one point, a source to a destination, right? But the streaming is basically, I handle a whole and ongoing delivery of all of these event messages. So makes it very, very powerful too, that, that the need, you know, for this kind of system. So, 
let's take a look then what is driving the change? Why do we need event streaming? But as such, we already talk about real-time analytics is a good candidate to make use of, you know, like event streaming. So for example, we want the data to be real-time, right? To This will enhance your customer's experience, right? Create a competitive advantage for your business too. And Another thing is basically it allows you to use data pipelines for machine learning type of applications for AI type of applications too, or it also helps with scalability aspect, right? Let's say, right, you, you have many brokers handle all of the messages that comes in, but because the broker doesn't have to worry about where to send the messages to, I only label it and say, okay, messages comes in, I have a topic. So it's basically telling the broker how to route the messages. I have a topic, label it. And so basically too, in that case, it frees up all of the producer clients not to have to worry about keeping address of the receiver. You decouple the sender and the receiver. So as a result, if you need to scale it, it's actually much faster because of, you know, you just need to have the, the topic, right? To handle all of the messages. So um, so essentially that's what it is. And the here too, it just summarizes, you know, it allows event streaming. It allows for real-time processing, right? Um, make decisions in real time. And that's what our analytics need, right? Not after the event. In just high frequency of messages with very low latency. And over here, I just wanted to point out too, there's also streaming and then versus not streaming. So let's take a quick look at it, right? What we are used to in the past are not streaming. So basically there are extract, transform, load, ETL process, right? There are more batch basically ingest data, and then data comes in and it persists it to some sort of data store, let's say a database. And from there, you then select the data, do whatever you need. And then from there, you push the data down to the, so to speak, stream it like pipeline, whatever it is. But as you can see, it's slower because you involve a data store in between. So anytime you do this kind of data store, IO thing, you're going to get slowed down, you know, no matter what you do, even though you think, okay, it's faster, faster, IO is faster, you still slow things down. However, for doing streaming, and here's the thing, you're ingesting data, and the data doesn't actually get to the disk, it's basically all in memory, you are ingesting it, you're processing the data right away. And what do you do, right? Let's say I mentioned about Pulsar function too, uh, later, uh, the Pulsar function can allow you to transform all the data that's flowing through the pipeline. And then when you transform, you can write it to a sync, right? It can be written to uh, Elasticsearch sync, a database sync, right, so to speak, and so, so on and so forth. So that's the advantages of using streaming versus not streaming. And here it is, Pulsar. I want to kind of give a, uh, you know, five minutes kind of intro to it now. It is an open source project created by Yahoo. Uh, Yahoo contributed to Apache Software Foundation in 2016. It has become a top level project less in less than two years because everybody is recognizing how important it is now to do event streaming in the cloud and they can deliver, Pulsar can deliver. Pulsar itself has a very native kind of cloud native awareness. It's designed with the cloud in mind, cloud native design cluster-based, and also is a multi-tenant uh, kind of a model. Essentially, you can have data that you can separate into different units of namespace of operations. That's already kind of being done in a multi-tenancy format. So it makes it much kind of nicer too, right? All of these things too, uh, Pulsar handles for you. Again, it separates out the compute and the storage. Compute is the broker handling all of the messages, all of the policies, blah, blah, blah. They, you know, kind of get the message from the producer, deliver them accordingly, and handles all of the dead letter queues, whatever time to live. But at the same time, all of the things you're not you're done, just throw it over if it fends to the Apache bookie, right? So it separates out. So anytime you need to add a node to your cloud infrastructure, basically it can scale independently and then it makes your job easier, right? For example, if you use something like the older messaging systems, then if you need to like, you know, do redundancy, um, increase the number of nodes in a, in a cluster, whatever, you have to do a lot of manual thing, right? With some of the older messaging. So, so that's the thing. And also too, you can write your client code in Java, in C Sharp too, and Python and Go and other community contribution too, including, I think, I believe Rust is there, Scala is there too, if you're into those things. Okay. Also, it guarantees your message delivery. So if a message successfully reaches a broker, so it will be delivered to the intended target too. So don't worry about it. You know, if your network goes down, once your message re reach a broker, it, the broker will take care of things for you. So guarantee. Um, also too, um, there's this serverless function I talk about 
essentially to serverless functions is works kind of like AWS, AWS Lambda. It's basically small bite size. You can transform the data as it flows through the data pipeline within the cluster. So it's, it makes it very, very efficient, very convenient, so to speak, right, to do a lightweight too. And also it has a tiered storage offload. So if you have data that's kind of becoming cold and stale, you don't want to take room up in the main storage. You offload it to the long-term storage. So with Pulsar kind of handles a lot of the, so to speak, all of the infrastructural concern for you. So it kind of frees up if you're a developer. It actually makes your life easier. Okay, so what is uh, Apache Pulsar over here? I think I already mentioned about is Yahoo and their increasing number of uh, GitHub stars contributors like that. So now who else is using? I wanted to point out Yahoo in here. Yahoo Japan is also one of our biggest user. And then there are other companies that's listed here and there are more too that are not shown in here, but these are like the major initial adopters of Apache Pulsar. Okay, so Pulsar is different, but I just want to point out there's producer, consumer, that's what you write the code in right? Producer, consumer, client, and then work, interact with the broker. Broker will communicate with the bookkeeper and zookeeper. You need to look up messages. You go through the broker too. So, all right. So all these, I won't kind of step through. They do get into quite deep about, you know, what, why do you want a Pulsar? But I just wanted to highlight a couple of, you know, Pulsar um, kind of specific features. One is a data pipeline, right? We talk about the pipeline of, think of it like water flowing through the pipeline, get into Pulsar, that's all the transformation. When it's done, it output data to a sink. That's the idea, data pipeline. And then essentially too, what does the transformation is using Pulsar functions? Lightweight, right? Allows a complex stream streaming processing, very lightweight weight. It's kind of like a AWS Lambda or Google function. Right now, it's only supports like Java, Python, and Go, but there will be more languages supported too. And then there's also Pulsar schema too. So schema is anytime you do need to do distributed messaging over the wire, you need to deserialize it, right? Or serialize it to flatten your data structure get it over the wire, over to your destination, you need to deserialize it, reconstruct the object. That's a lot of work too, right? And so basically, if you use this feature called Pulsar Schema, it basically will keep track of your changes of your data structure. So that's just something to let you know. There's also Pulsar IO. So I talk about source and sync. You need to write you know, different connectors. You can output it to a Kafka sync, rapid MQ sync, a source could be uh, Cassandra, whatever it is. Like if it is in there, you can write your own using Pulsar IO. Okay, so these are data stacks flavors. I don't want to spend way too much time because this isn't, so to speak, you know, these are our commercial side of things. These are Astro streaming, but you get a $25 credit if you want to use that to test things out, right? Essentially, is Pulsar already managed in the cloud. It's, it's kind of makes it very easier. Uh, $25 per month and $300 a year. So give that a try, right? I have the link in my resource section too. There's also Luna streaming, right? Uh, enterprise support and open source too, if you want to do it open source. Now, back to here. So building a user-facing real-time analytics, we use Pulsar. And then who else? We combine it with Apache Pino. Pino, I just want to quickly kind of point out to you, as you can see, there are different sources, you know, going to the events is very much event-driven um, kind of a way of doing things too. And basically too, um, real-time ingestion, it has, you know, Pulsar coming in, a Pino controller, and then it also segment off, you know, using Zookeeper of the different uh, server and then brokers will handle all of the queries too. And it consumes and index and surf. And one thing just wanted to point out the star tree index in here. It's, it's actually very fast. It's their proprietary uh, algorithms uh, too. But like I said, you can also talk with Mark. He will give you more information. And summary too, as you can see, you know, latency wise is milliseconds, freshness seconds and concurrency is millions of users, right? Okay, star tree index. So I won't go into all the detail, but this is the, who are the companies using um, Pino, right? Stripe, I mentioned LinkedIn is a big one too. Um, and then with that, you know, I think I will just uh, go into here to share with you, you know, these are Apache Pino and how do you reach Mark, you know, and he also has this example of using Pulsar and then feeding into Pino to, to do a simple test case too. And then Apache Pulsar, as I mentioned, astra.datastacks.com is where you go and get a sign up for a free account, get $25 credit too. Oops, and I guess, I guess it's here, uh, okay. I think here, okay, back here. And oh, okay, these are just uh, additional discount and things. And also, oops, I think uh, you have to go back and, okay. Uh, I think, 
uh, I think I have to basically go back here <laughs> sometimes to uh, this one. Okay. All right, I click on the wrong thing. And then if you want Pulsar on YouTube, there, this is the link. And also I have my Mary's uh, Twitch stream on Twitch every uh, Wednesday at 2 p.m. Central time. Please follow me. I'll do a lot of hands-on coding. Also follow us on uh, Apache Neighborhood, Pulsar Neighborhood. You can contribute to it. It's our wiki page. With that, I want to thank you very much. I believe that I'm out of time now, but thank you so much for having sat through my talk and feel free to reach out to me, also to Mark for more Apache Pinot questions. Thanks a lot. Enjoy the rest of your conference.